This week on the Crypto Mile, we will be exploring blockchain technology. We'll be meeting with Cardano's co-founder, Charles Hoskinson, and director of African operations, John O'Connor. We'll be discussing the potential of the blockchain and their team's groundbreaking plans for bringing this technology to Africa. Then we'll check in with Clev Mesidor to discuss cryptocurrency adoption in black and Latino communities and her work with the Blockchain Foundation. Welcome to the Crypto Mile. The world was first introduced to blockchain technology by the anonymous Satoshi Nakamoto when Bitcoin was launched in 2009. The revolution that the Bitcoin blockchain provided was a method of monetary transfer that negated the need for trusted third parties such as banks. However, this technology is no longer only used with Bitcoin, as there are currently at least a thousand other blockchains in operation. The Bitcoin blockchain only settles monetary transactions. However, in 2015, the Ethereum network expanded what a blockchain was capable of. Ethereum allowed for the possibility of smart contracts. These allow people to transfer money, property rights, artistic royalties, or anything of value in a transparent way. Utilizing distributed ledger technology, these blockchains are visible to anyone and reveal the exact time and amount of digital currency that has been transferred between individuals. Essentially, this groundbreaking technology will underpin and support the structure of Web3, the future evolution of the internet. Next, we'll be heading downtown to chat with John O'Connor about the potential of blockchain technologies to transform the lives of billions of people from developing countries. Today, we are speaking to John O'Connor, Director of African Operations for Cardano. John, welcome to the Crypto Mile. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Looking forward to the discussion. What are the benefits of having property deeds, credit rating, health information, and maybe educational qualifications on the Cardano blockchain? Property deeds is an interesting one because um, for a specific set of countries, um, often people will talk about this in regards to Africa, uh, you have a long history of property ownership being lost over time. Um, you'll have a coup or a regime change, and it's very easy for the new government to be able to deny the ownership of various pieces of land based on the interests of the time. So one of the reasons why people talk about pro property ownership in regards to blockchain is this idea of creating this ledger, this immutable ledger, which is actually recording the ownership of property, but isn't beholden to a government department. I think one of the other examples which you asked about was education. Mm. So in Ethiopia, we have a project with the Ministry of Education, where we're providing uh, digital grade tracking for 5 million uh, students. So the benefit of our system is also that students can prove their education, even if the school with which they went to or the university that they went to is no longer capable of responding back. You mentioned Ethiopia, and I also think Kenya. Within the Kenyan context, the thing which we're excited about is trying to shift from blockchain and cryptocurrencies being this ethereal thing that you watch the prices go up and down on, to actually using blockchain and cryptocurrencies to provide real finance to real people. So our goal here is to enable the provision of working capital finance to small and medium sized enterprises by providing them with the identity, the digital identity that they need to prove the credit worthiness of their businesses to an international set of investors. Thank you very much. Most appreciated. Thank you so much for having me. Next up, we'll check in with Cardano co-founder Charles Hoskinson. Joining us is Charles Hoskinson co-founder of the blockchain engineering company Input Output and the Cardano blockchain. Charles, welcome to the Crypto Mile. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Why do you think we need a more decentralized world? We want to live in a global society. And if you want to live in a global society, one of the first things you don't want is for one actor in that global society to have complete control over critical things, resources. So the point of cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology is they take those resources that should be kind of a public good and if they're digitizable, get them into a situation where they're completely open and uh, basically could then build businesses on top of that. But the underlying infrastructure is no longer controlled. If you have centralization, one person basically gets to decide those rules. And uh, oftentimes those become very anti-competitive 
and they actually become anti-consumer and they end up hurting people or exposing people to um, a lot of market failures. Do you think we're coming to the end of nation state power? And if so, what kind of global structures are going to evolve? So I don't really view it as let's get rid of the nation state. What happens is you can start taking lots of government services and put them into a structure where they have radical transparency. Suddenly, all of your tax revenue is open source and everybody can look at it and see where the money's going. At the end of the day, you have less friction, less fraud, less waste, less abuse, more transparency, and ultimately less consolidation of power. China doesn't have a back door. America doesn't have a back door. If it's truly a permissionless ledger, the poorest person, the, the most vulnerable person, has equal access to, the, to as the president of the United States does. There's never been a time in human history that that's been the case. How many countries in the world are actually considering this at this moment in time? Yeah, a lot have. You know, for, for example, the concept of a digital government, uh, Estonia has been one of the world leaders there. The country of Georgia is also pursuing it. Blockchain is a very powerful thing, and almost every country has done some form of pilot for a blockchain-based system to store these types of things. It really comes down to, are you going to do it in a permissionless way or a permission way? In other words, will the country control the ledger, or will that ledger be an open global ledger? Uh, and we've seen countries explore both. Charles Hoskinson, thank you very much for coming on the Crypto Mile. It's great to see you. This was a heck of a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Rounding out our discussions on blockchain technology today is Clev Mesador. Clev Mesador, welcome to the Crypto Mile. You are the executive director of the Blockchain Foundation and presidential appointee to the Obama administration. It's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for having me on. You're the founder of the National Policy Network of Women of Color in Blockchain. Can you describe your role in that, please? Yes. You know, women of color is a fast growing demographic in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. So in 2019, you know, I partnered with the Blockchain Association to host the first delegation of women of color in blockchain. We brought a delegation of 25 women from across the country who are building on the technology to Washington so that members of Congress can see their constituents, people who look like them, like people who are holding them accountable, who are not wealthy, big players. It seems to me that a lot of the advances in crypto adoption seems to be coming from the Black and Latino communities. Can you describe why that is? Yeah, I tell people all the time, your, your, the appeal to crypto for any individual will be based on your relationship with money. So for people who have been locked out of traditional finance, and I'm not just talking about the unbanked, there's a sense that it's just the unbanked. No, it's professionals like myself who are Gen Xers, who have advanced degrees, who make good money, but banks have never served us well. So that's why you're seeing the greatest initial gravitation from these communities. So you worked with Obama, and uh, now, what is his view on the potential of blockchain technology? Do you know? I was proud to serve in the Obama administration. It was during the Obama administration in 2013 that I first heard about Bitcoin. <laughs> I don't believe President Obama has asserted a position on blockchain cryptocurrency. We were pleasantly surprised when, when President Biden put out the executive order earlier this year on cryptocurrencies, which did not seek to relitigate whether the technology is good and bad, but looked at cryptocurrency from the lens of innovation and competitiveness. It has been absolutely amazing chatting to you. Thank you very much for coming on the Crypto Mind. Thank you for having me on. Blockchain technology is certainly still in its developmental stage, about where the internet was in the mid-1990s. The blockchain promises to form the bedrock of Web3 and to transform the current internet of information into an internet of value. But if we relinquish the social, economic and governmental fabric of society over to the blockchain, what are the unforeseen dangers? Will we be swapping the imperfect management of centralized authorities for a new system of control? That is why strong governance systems are needed to guide the software updates, technical improvements and funding decisions that shape the underlying code of the blockchain to ensure it always remains democratic. Will our new masters be the encoded protocols of the blockchain itself? Or will blockchain technology be the solution to finally putting the power and ownership of data back in the hands of the people? Thanks for joining us this week on the Crypto Mile. I'll see you next week.